Okay, hello everyone. I'm uh, Bruce Schottman, spinal surgeon uh, from Scotland. Uh, how are you guys all doing? I presume, good. So, I don't know if many of you managed to attend the talk uh, a couple of weeks ago where we went through the history of um, musculoskeletal system. So now this time, we're just gonna specifically concentrate on uh, spine alone. Uh, on the history and examination of spinal conditions. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions as we go through, if you've got any, otherwise we can have some time at the end. Sorry, it's just a little bit. Okay, can you see my screen well? Yeah, okay. So history taking is a fine art. It's very important because it unravels the mystery of patient symptoms and it also helps you come down to a most likely diagnosis. So history taking is actually 75% of making a diagnosis for a patient. Physical examination adds to it and pretty much if you have a very good history and you've done a good a thorough examination, you may be able to narrow down the diagnosis. So that is why we harp on so much about a good history taking. It is sort of becoming a forgotten art these days now because of availability of a lot of investigations. Now, what the eyes don't see, the mind will not know, okay? So it is very important for you to know things on the background, you know, for you to be able to go into a thorough history and also able to do an examination. So what I'm going to do is go through a little bit of anatomy and a little bit of pathology about the different conditions of spine. So you guys have an understanding of what you will be dealing with so that then when you come to take a history and do an examination, you know what to look for. So as far as the anatomy of the spine is concerned, you have bones and then you have discs between them. You have ligaments which are connecting all these bones and you have the spinal cord and the nerves, the muscles supporting them. Let's just look through each one of them in a bit more detail. So there are three regions in the spine, as you all know, you know, you have a cervical, thoracic and a lumbar region. The cervical region has uh, seven vertebrae. The upper cervical C1 and C2 are a bit uh, different ones, while from C3 to C7, they're all a typical cervical vertebrae. You've got 12 thoracic vertebrae and five lumbar vertebrae. In the sacrum, you actually have five segments, but they're all fused to form one bone. And in the coccyx, again, you have four segments which are fused to form one bone. So in total, you have 33 bones in your cervical spine. And as you can see, the spine is not a straight structure. It's got a curve to it. It's more like a lazy S shape. Now, do you think we were born with that curved shape, S shape? Anybody? Alex. Um, I think babies' backs tend to be a little bit flatter. Flatter? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's see if it was like that. So when you are actually as a fetus, you don't have a flat curve. You just have more like a C curve. Okay. But once the infant starts crawling up and start lifting their head up, they start developing their lumbar curve. And once they've stood up, then they start getting this thoracic and the cervical curve as well. And that is how they develop the, you know, this lazy S shape. So that gives them a very balanced spine. This is very important for you to know the shape of the spine so that when you go into the examination, you know what exactly you're going to be looking for. So the primary curve of the spine is a kyphotic spine, but the lumbar lordosis and the cervical lordosis that develops happens once we develop, you know, assume a standing posture. So a normal cervical lordosis is around 20 to 40 degrees. Thoracic kyphosis is around 20 to 40 degrees. 
uh, lumbar lordosis is around 30 to 50 degrees. Some people can have a bit of an exaggerated kyphosis or lordosis, but as far as they are in a good balance, that is the most important thing to look for. So we'll have a look at the bit of a bony anatomy now. So Charlotte, do you know what that is? Or do you know who it is? Atlas. Atlas, yeah. Very good. Okay, so, and that is Atlas is the first bone, C1, okay? And you can see it's supporting the weight of the head, like Atlas was supporting the world, okay? And then you have C2. So these two have a different shape compared to the rest of the cervical vertebrae. So on the left, you see C1, which is like a ring. And on the right, you see C2, which is like got a little peg on it. So the C1 actually rotates around that peg, okay? Now, so this picture shows how a typical cervical, thoracic, and a lumbar vertebrae appear. So the top is a cervical vertebrae, the middle is a thoracic vertebrae, and the bottom most is a lumbar vertebrae. And you can see the lumbar vertebrae is much bigger than a cervical or a thoracic. The other things to note is look at the vertebral body sizes in the front, how that changes, and look at the facet joints. Uh, just a second, let me see if I can get a pointer. Can you see me pointing to that or? Uh... No? Okay, let me just. Uh... Can you see that? Can you see the pointer now? Uh, you can't. No. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Okay. Anyway, so the, the joints are at the back, the facet joints, and you can see the orientation of the facet joints, how they change from the cervical all the way down to the lumbar. Now the discs are in between the vertebral bodies, as you can see here, they are like a cushioning structure. And the discs normally take 70 to 80% of the load of your weight because they are the cushioning structures. And only 20 to 30% of the weight gets transmitted through the posterior part of your spine. And in the in-between area is where your spinal canal is, where the spinal cord runs along with the nerves. And you can see the ligaments of the spine here. So you have an anterior longitudinal ligament, which runs in the front of the vertebral body. And you have a posterior longitudinal ligament which runs at the back of the vertebral body. And then you have the interspinous ligament which is connecting the vertebral bodies itself. It just goes between you know, adjacent vertebrae. And then you will have a supraspinous ligament which is at the back of the spinous process which runs all the way down. And then you will also have an interspinous ligament. So there is also something called as a ligamentum flavum. It's called flammum because it's yellow in color. And that is just uh, behind the spinal canal. So when you're going from the back, you go through the epidural fat, then you'll have the ligamentum flammum to enter into your spinal canal. So the muscles of the back, there are a lot of muscles in the back, but from your point of view, the main thing you need to understand is that there are three main layers. There is a superficial layer, a middle layer, and a deep layer. So the superficial layer is the erector spinae muscle. These, all these muscles run all the way from your occiput down to your sacrum and they connect at multiple levels as well. And then the middle group is called the semispinalis, depending on at what area it is. If it is around the head, it's called the capitis. If it is around the neck, it's called the cervices. And if it's in this thoracic spine, it's called the thoracis. So you have the erector spinae, the semispinalis, and the deep muscles, which are the rotators and the multifidus. Now, the most important structure, what this, all of these things are trying to do is support your spinal cord. And your spinal cord is the continuation of your brain, which runs all the way down. So do you think the spinal cord continues all the way down to the sacrum? Let me see if I can find someone else. Steven. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So do you think the spinal cord runs all the way down to the sacrum? No, it stops at L3. 
L2, L3 or something. Okay. L2, L3. Okay, you're pretty close. Okay, now this is an MRI scan where you can actually see I've labeled T12, L1. Can you see adjacent to T12, L1 where the thickness of the spinal cord ends? And below that, it's just the tuft of nerves which run down. What do you think that's called, Stephen? Um, the, uh, I can't remember what it's called, corda equina. Yeah, yeah, very good, yeah. So corda equina means a horse's tail. So it's just a tuft of nerves that hang out from that level. So essentially in the lumbar spine area, you don't have a spinal cord. What you have is just nerves at the level of the lumbar spine. So from L1, L2 area, might vary a little bit in different patients, but pretty much if you come down, it's only nerves, it's not a spinal cord. Now the spinal cord has three coverings. You have a dura, arachnoid, and the pia mater which covers it. And as you can see in this picture, you can see the spinal nerves which come out from the spinal cord and they run out between each level of the vertebrae. So how many spinal nerves do you think we have? Priscilla. Priscilla, can you hear me? Yes, sorry. Okay. I'm trying to keep you all awake now, you know? So how many spinal nerves do you think <clears throat> you have? How many spinal nerves? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let me make it a bit easier. So if we have 12 thoracic vertebrae, do you think we have yeah. 12 thoracic nerves? Yeah, but aren't there like nerves coming out on each side? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, 12 pairs of nerves. That's what I mean. Sorry. Yeah, 12 pairs of thoracic nerves. Yeah. Okay. And lumbar? Uh, lumbar, there's five. Yeah, so there'll be five pairs of lumbar nerve roots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about cervical? Uh, eight. But there's well, only seven vertebrae, pairs, isn't it? Sorry. There's only seven vertebrae in the cervical spine, isn't it? So the nerves right. are paired along to the vertebrae. So you said 12 thoracic vertebrae and you've got 12 thoracic nerves. Yeah. Five lumbar vertebrae and you've got five lumbar nerve, you know, nerve roots. Yeah. But why in the cervical you've got seven vertebrae but eight nerves? It's a bit of a... It doesn't work out that way, is it? It doesn't match up very well. That's because the nerves were labeled according to the somites. The somites is where your spine formed. So there were eight somites in the cervical spine, but when they became vertebrae, they became only seven vertebrae. So that is why you have only seven bones, but you still have eight cervical nerves. Right, okay. So it, the reason why it is very important to know is you can see in this picture, you've got C1 to C8 uh, cervical nerves, and then the 12 thoracic nerves, five lumbar nerves, five sacral nerves, and one coccygeal nerve. So other than the cervical, everything else follows with the number of vertebral bodies, okay? And you can see here how the number one cervical nerve comes on top of the C1 vertebrae. So if you follow that pattern, you'll have the number seven cervical nerve going on top of the seventh cervical vertebrae and your eighth cervical nerve is going to be top of T1. So from T1 onwards, the nerves are going to be the level below that vertebrae, but in the cervical, the nerves are going to be above the vertebrae. So a C5 nerve will be above the C5 vertebral body or between the C4 and C5, while in the thoracic, a T1 will be between the T1 and T2. And that follows the same way down into a lumbar spine as well. So between L4 and L5, you will have the L4 nerve root. And between L5 and S1, you will have the L5 nerve root. Does that make sense? Is everyone clear on that? Has anyone got any questions yeah. on that? So, this is very important to know because this is what is going to help you make a diagnosis later on. So in the cervical spine, the nerves are above the corresponding vertebral bodies. But in the thoracic and in the lumbar spine, 
the nerves are below the corresponding vertebral bodies. This is mainly because of the number of nerves are different in the cervical spine. Okay. Now, and this picture shows that as well. On the left, if you look at the cervical spine, you can see between C5 and C6, the C6 root goes out because you can see the C6 is above the C6 vertebral body. In C6 and C7, the C7 nerve goes out, okay? And if you look at the lumbar spine between L4 and L5, the L4 nerve goes out, okay? Now, it is also important to note the way the nerve is actually uh, in the uh, spine, the cervical and then the lumbar spine. In the cervical spine, you can see the nerves have got a more horizontal course, while in the lumbar spine, they've got a more a long uh, longitudinal descent, and then they go out between the vertebral bodies. So what these nerves do when they come out is they supply the skin, the sensory supply, and then they supply the, mo the motor power to the upper and the lower limbs. So it is important to know where exactly the distribution is, so that will help you with your examination. So what we talk about the sensory supply is the dermatomes. So you can see the dermatomal distribution of the different nerves in the upper limb. So each nerve can have a bit of an overlap of the areas where they develop and they don't have to be specifically limited to in every patient. But then there are some specific points which are only supplied by that nerves, which you should know, so that you can be very specific when you examine. So for C5, I would recommend that you examine on the regimen's patch area, Just a second, let me see if I can, which is on the side of your arm, that is C5, okay? C6 would be your first web space on the dorsum of your hand. C7 is your middle finger tip, Okay, C8, ulnar border of your hand. Okay, T1 is medial part of your forearm. And T2 is upper, upper part, you know, medial part of your arm. So if you just remember that pattern, C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1, just like a scheme, then it's much easier to remember and reproduce it again. So that's for the uh, dermatomes. Now, the myotomes are the muscles that you're going to be testing. So you test the shoulder shrug, ask them to shrug their shoulders, and you resist it, and that is C4. Elbow flexion, C5. Wrist extension, C6. Elbow extension, you just resist them, okay? That's elbow extension, C7. And finger flexion is C8. So just remember that as eight, okay? Finger flexion and finger abduction is T1, okay? So shoulder shrug, elbow flexion, wrist extension, elbow extension, and then finger flexion and finger abduction. So when it comes to the lower limbs, uh, for the sensory uh, dermatomes, you look at L1, the easiest to remember is the inguinal ligament area where your pockets are, that's L1. L2 is medial thigh, just on the medial part, mid part of the thigh. L3 is medial knee. L4 is medial um, malleolus, which is just on the medial side of the ankle. Uh, L5 is your first web space. And S1 is the lateral aspect of your ankle. So I'm just gonna use my son to just uh, help you uh, demonstrate the myotomes. See that? Can you come here, please? Come and lie down here. Okay. Now, the easiest way to demonstrate the myotomes is, can you lift your leg up? Keep your knees straight and lift it up. Hold it there, don't let me push it down. So that's hip flexion, L2. Bend your knee, straighten it. That's knee extension, okay? Now, pull your ankle up towards you. Keep it pulled up. That's ankle dorsiflexion, L4. And now pull your big toe up towards you. That's L5, okay? And push your feet down. Push your feet down towards me. And that's S1, okay? So with the patient lying down, you will be able to do all the myotomes 
and go through from, from L2 to S1. Okay. Thank you, Siddharth. So that's pretty much covering the anatomy. The most important thing is knowing the nerve distribution, knowing what the myotomes and the dermatomes are, which is what is going to help you with your examination. Now you need to know what pathologies are, you know, existent with these spinal problems. So only then, you know, you will know what exactly to ask the patients for when you question them in their history. So when you see a patient with a spinal pathology, 85% of them is going to be a degenerative pathology. Okay. It's less than 10% is going to be the other pathologies, which may have some of them are sinister ones like infection, trauma, or tumor. Deformity is less than two to three percent of the spinal pathologies that we would see so common things common it's mostly going to be a degenerative pathology that you're dealing with but it is very important that you don't miss out on any of the sinister pathologies like an infection trauma or tumor so looking at the age distribution of these pathologies you can see in this graph from 20 to 65 majority of the conditions are but majority of them in that age group would be a degenerative pathology but in the younger age group in less than 20 if somebody is going to be presenting with a back pain you should be thinking about infection tumor you know those are the most two common things which is then followed by Schumann's disease or spondylolysis but on high on your thing should be infection and tumor Again, in the older age group, you should be thinking about tumor, infection, and fractures which can happen, pathological fractures which can happen, like osteoporosis, even without any significant trauma, you can get those fractures. So to rule out these sinister pathologies, why we specifically look for uh, you know, red flag symptoms while you ask the questions, which is trying to find out if there could be an infection, trauma, tumor, or any special conditions like Cauda equina syndrome. So the degenerative pathology spectrum, when what we mean by spondylosis is just a degenerative spine. It doesn't have to be any uh, significant problem in them. It's just a very blanket term for any degree of degeneration. It's called as a spondylosis. It could be cervical or lumbar. So why is it more common that you get degeneration in your cervical or your lumbar spine? Stefan? Um, are the uh, parts of the spine, spine where you have the most movement? Possibly? Yeah, very good. So your thoracic spine doesn't move much and that is why you don't get that much degenerative problems in your thoracic spine. The most moving part of your spine is your lumbar and then your cervical. So that is why you most of the time get problems there. So because it's moving, you can get these degenerative problems, which can range from having a disc prolapse or a spondylolisthesis where one bone is slipping in front of the other, or the last one would be a spinal stenosis, which essentially means the space for the spinal cord or the nerves is narrowed down and that is causing the compression resulting in the symptoms. You should also remember that not all patients who present with back pain necessarily need to have a pathology in their spine itself. There can be other non-spinal causes of pain. This is what is going to help you make up your differential diagnosis. Patients presenting with back pain can have renal problems, having kidney stones, can have an aneurysm, and even pancreatitis can present as back pain. When patients present with arm pain, you should be thinking about whether it could be coming from the shoulder, uh, could be thoracic outlet syndrome, or it could be a cardiac cause as well. Leg pain, some patients who have leg pain can be, can be from the hips or knees and vascular problems can also present like spinal stenosis. You should never forget the cranial causes of uh, loss of balance and falls. So the format for history taking is pretty uh, same for most of, you know, in all your systems, what you would do. You would find out what the presenting complaint is finding out about the history of the presenting complaint, further details about their medical history, drug history, social history, family history, and patients' ideas, concerns, and expectations. Now, we're gonna look a bit more specifically into the presenting complaint. 
So the main uh, presenting complaint with spinal patients is going to be pain, which uh, we further classify into axial pain or radicular pain. What we mean by axial pain is presenting with back pain, it can be either in the neck or in the lower back or in the thoracic area itself. A radicular pain is when they have a pain that is radiating down their upper limb or in their lower limb, which is usually because of a nerve compression. Patients can also present with neurological symptoms. They can say as sensory disturbance, just pins and needles or numbness. They can uh, present to you with motor weakness. And a very, very small proportion of people present with a deformity. Usually it is in the younger age group, in the adolescents with a deformity or in the older age group. But the, pro the proportion of people with the deformity is very small. So as with any, uh, any other system, when you take a, a elicit a history for pain, it's, a, it's the same thing. You should just follow the Socrates mnemonic to elicit about the details of the pain. Find out where the pain is, whether it is in the cervical region, thoracic, or in the lumbar region. Which area, if someone presents with pain in the thoracic region, would that be more concerning than your lumbar or thoracic? Uh, Gamisha. Uh, Gamisha, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. I'd say yes. Okay, why is that? Because you can already rule out that it's not likely to be degenerative cause. Okay. So, so it's a red flag. You're going to be concerned that this could be some other sinister pathology if they have a thoracic pain, yeah? So the onset of pain, whether it was a gradual onset pain or whether it was a sudden onset pain, what's a, what is the character of pain? If it is a dull aching pain, usually degenerative conditions cause a dull aching or a throbbing pain. Uh, if they have a sharp pain or if it is uh, like more like an electric pain, it might be a suggestive of, of a neurological cause. How far does the pain radiate down? Now that we've gone through the dermatomes and myotomes, you may be able to narrow down which level the problem is, depending on where they say the pain goes down. If they say the pain goes down all the way into your thumbs and your index finger, you're thinking about whether it could be a C6, C7 pathology. If it, they say it goes into their ulnar side of their wrist, you would think whether it's a C8 or a T1 pathology. As far as the lumbar spine is concerned, if they say it's going to the big toe, you're gonna to be thinking about a pathology at L5S1. Associated symptoms like uh, pins and needles, weakness, numbness. Timing of pain is very important. If the pain is mainly worse at night, you should be thinking that is there a sinister pathology underlying because uh, infection and tumor, the pain is usually worse at night. You should also elicit the exacerbating and relieving factors and what treatment they've had so far. It is useful to find out about the severity of their pain by asking about, you know, on a scale of zero to 10, how bad it is. Sorry, just a quick question. It's um, important think, to um, know um, how it's affecting their fu function and their activities of daily living. Uh, walking distance is a very useful uh, question to ask. You know, if they're not able to tell you in the distance itself, it would be worth asking them you know, how long they can walk and also if they're able to look after themselves. So the red flags that you should uh, always make sure that you cover in your history, age less than 20 or more than 65, that's a red flag, thoracic pain, night pain, see if they have any systemic symptoms which may indicate that they may have uh, like, uh, you know, infection or tumor. Usually the systemic symptoms that we question them are fever, loss of weight, chills and rigors. You should inquire about any history of cancer and if also they've had any recent infection. Immunocompromised status, if they are on any um, uh, steroids or if they are a diabetic, that should raise the risk, um, suspicion that they may have some sinister pathology. Associated symptoms like bowel and bladder symptoms is uh, important to know because it may point towards a cauda equina syndrome or a cauda uh, spinal cord compression. 
Any questions so far about the history? No, sir, that not you. You can go now. Okay. Uh, let's look at the examination of the spine. So I've just divided it into the same pattern as you would do any other musculoskeletal examination. Okay. Look, feel, move, and special tests. So in look, you're going to be looking at uh, the spine profile, looking at the skin, and also the gait. So when you look at their spine profile, it is important to note that, you know, their head is centered over their pelvis, both in the sagittal and in the coronal profile. What we mean by sagittal is you're looking at the patient from the side and you can see on the picture on the left, the patient's got a good cervical lordosis, thoracic kyphosis and a lumbar lordosis. And you would comment saying that this patient's uh, spine appears balanced looking from the side. On the middle picture, you can see he's got an increased thoracic kyphosis. And on the right side picture, you can see he's got an increased lumbar lordosis. These may suggest that they may have some underlying problems. So you should also look from the back and you can see in this picture that uh, there is a slight deformity. He has some very mild scoliosis. Even if, uh, if patients are quite uh, chubby and you're not able to see a scoliosis, there may be other things that might point to saying that they may have a spinal deformity, like looking at the levels of the shoulder. So if you look at this young boy, you can see his uh, left shoulder is higher up than the left. Sorry, left is higher up than the right. And you can also note a waist asymmetry. If you look at the lines on either sides, you can see it doesn't look symmetrical. So these things point to that he may have a spinal deformity. If sometimes uh, things are not very obvious, you can ask them to do a forward bend, which will usually show the deformity more obviously. You can see here, there is an exaggerated uh, rib hump on the right side. And this test is called an Adams forward bend test. So when you also look at the skin, there are certain things you should specifically look for. This is usually in children, but sometimes you may also find these things in adults. And we call this group of things as cutaneous markers of spinal dystrophism. What essentially this means is there may be something abnormal within the spinal cord or the spinal canal, but it's only by, uh, you can only see that, you're not able to see that obviously, but you can pick it up with these uh, changes on the skin. So if someone has hyperpigmentation around their skin, or if they have a tuft of hair, You can see here in the first picture on the left, uh, there's a bit of a tuft of hair in the uh, lumbar spine area that points to they may have a spinal occult uh, spinal pathology like uh, spina bifida occulta. And if they have a little um, sinus, that should raise a suspicion. If they have any uh, port vein stain, uh, port vein stain like a capillary hemangioma or if the natal cleft appears deviated, then that should also raise a suspicion. So the picture on the right top shows a port wine stain and at the bottom there is a dermal sinus. You should uh, look at the patient's gait and uh, see whether uh, if you can pick up any abnormality. Most of the times when we see the older patients, it's usually an antalgic gait or they walk with a broad-based gait because they're sensory disturbance. You should uh, also, when they finished walking, check, uh, do the Romberg's test. Sujoy, do you know what a Romberg's test is? Sujoy, no, not there. Hello? Can you hear me, Sujoy? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what a Romberg's test is? No. Is, is it the um, closing the eyes uh, and saying if you... Sorry, I think you need to put your volume up a bit. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's better. Uh, so is it the one where you ask the patient Hello? to close their eyes and see if they fall over? Yeah, that's correct. 
So once they've finished their gate and they're standing, you just ask them to close their eyes, but you reassure them that you're, you will make sure that they don't fall down. This is a different, uh, this is te testing your posterior column and your peripheral nerves as well, whether this is, um, the way to differentiate this with your cerebral thing is, when, if the patient sways with their eyes open, it points to a cerebr cerebellar pathology. But if they sway with their eyes closed, it points to a posterior column pathology. So, at, so you feel the skin, you feel for any warmth, and then you feel the tendon, feel for any tenderness in the midline, and also paravertebral tenderness. So you run down, uh, see that? Okay. okay. Turn around that way. So you just run your hand down the midline, okay? And then you feel on either side. What I would normally suggest in clinical practice is you can turn around so that you stand by the side so that you can look at the patient's face at the same time to see if you're eliciting any pain, okay? Or if there is a mirror in your clinic room, you can obviously look, look at the patient's face in the mirror. So you feel the midline tenderness all the way from the top, going all the way down in the midline and then in the paravertebral area on either sides and then also in the sacroiliac joints at the bottom. So you also look for any deformities, both in the sagittal plane and in the coronal plane. So you, next you come to the movements. In the cervical spine, you would do your flexion, forward flexion, extension, and then uh, lateral flexion on, on either sides and a rotational movement in the cervical spine. In the lumbar spine, you would do flexion, extension, lateral flexion, and rotation. A uh, modified Schrober's test is quite commonly described. Uh, one thing I would suggest is that you don't put your fingers like that because the web space limits how much extension uh, you will be able to check in your flexion, you will be able to check in your lumbar spine. I would suggest that you put two fingers like that at two spa, uh, bony landmarks and then ask the patient to bend forwards. Then as they bend forward, you will be able to see that the space widens up. And then when they come back, it just narrows down. So the special tests, I've divided them into the cervical and in the lumbar area. So in the cervical spine, if you're seeing a patient with a cervical problem, you would do a Sperling's test, which is testing for any nerve compression. But in the lumbar spine, you could do a straight leg tear race test. And then you would do a neurological examination in both the cervical and in the lumbar spine. It's always important that you conclude with a vascular examination testing for the peripheral pulses. You should always examine the neighboring joint to that part of the spine that you're examining because there could be uh, overlap of pathologies. Uh, if you're examining the cervical spine, you should at least say that I would want to examine the shoulder. And if you're doing a lumbar spine, you should examine the hips. Don't forget to examine for, for peripheral nerve compression in the upper limbs, like carpal tunnel, doing a phalanx test. So the Sperling's test, if the patient describes pain on their right arm, so you ask them to extend their neck and then you compress their head towards that side. So what that is doing is it's, uh, can you see that picture? Yeah. So it's trying to recreate the compression that they have in their cervical spine and see if that reproduces their symptoms. A straight leg raise test, you ask the patient to actively lift their leg up, see how far they can go. If they're not able to actively lift their leg, then you can lift their leg up. What, uh, so if the spinal nerve roots are running just next to the disc, if there is a disc bulge or if there is any nerve compression, so when the nerves get stretched out, when they're lifting their leg up, it reproduces their symptoms. A straight leg raise test is a very sensitive test, which means it can, it be positive in many conditions, but it's not very specific. So when they lift their leg up from zero to 30 degrees, some degree of nerve excursion will be there. And it's not very specific at that point. When they have pain from 30 to 70 degrees, then that specifically points to the problem being in the spine from your nerve root compression itself. So you ask them to lift to the point where they get the pain. At the point where they get the pain, you just lower it down a little bit and then you cause the dorsiflexion of the foot. 
And if that reproduces the pain again, that is a positive straight leg raise test. In the neurological examination, you would go through the tone, power, and you would grade the power from zero to five on the MRC grading, zero being no power, one just being a flicker, two having some movement, three is if you negate the gravity, they're able to do the movement, four is against gravity, and five is normal power. Sensation is graded from zero to two, zero is no sensation, one is altered sensation, and two is sensation is present. And reflexes would be graded from zero to four using a plus. Zero is no reflex. One is very mild reflex present. If you have two plus, then that is normal reflex. Three plus is a brisk reflex without a clonus, and four plus is along with a clonus. So we've gone through the upper limb dermatomes before. We know where exactly we need to test them for. So C5. Regimen patch just on the lateral aspect of the shoulder. C6, first web space. C7, the tip of your thumb. C8, ulnar border of your hand. And T1, medial border of your forearm. And we've gone through these myotomes as well. So when you test the reflexes, the C5 is your biceps reflex. C6 is a supinator reflex and C7 is your triceps reflex. Okay. And uh, when you examine the lower limbs, you check for the sensation. As we described before, L1 is in the inguinal area. L2 is medial thigh. L3 is medial knee. L4 is medial malleolus. And L5 is the first web space. And S1 will be the outer border of your foot. So we've gone through the myotomes, how to examine that. So you test the knee reflex. L3, 4 is the knee reflex. And ankle reflex is L5. And then you should always remember to do the Babinski reflex, which is a sign if you have a withdrawal reflex or if you have a upgoing plantus, then it points to a cranial problem or a spinal cord problem rather than a lower motor neuron problem. If patients have scoliosis, you should uh, always do an abdominal reflex because if an abdominal reflex is absent, it indicates that they may have an underlying spinal cord problem. So it's important to do the vascular examination, test the uh, pulses in the upper limb and also in the lower limb if you're doing a lumbar spine examination because uh, vascular problems like claudication symptoms can be present even if they have a uh, Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. As mentioned before, you should be doing a shoulder and a hip examination as well. So any questions so far? You could just type down on the comments if you have questions, otherwise, if you're shy to ask. So why is it night? Why is night pain a um, a red flag, and um, what's the so, behind it? Yeah, as mentioned before, degenerative problems usually are the pain is present when you're doing a movement. When you're getting pain at night, means when the muscles are all relaxed, there is uh, that is when usually the tumor pain and the infection pain is worse. If the pain is usually worse during the day, it is mostly because of degenerative problems. I say that makes sense. Thank you. Could um, you put the slide where you had put the degenerative signs back up, please? Degenerative, you mean uh, the conditions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Do you have any specific questions on that? No, that I was just checking to see if um, I had thought about one of the conditions properly. I just okay. thought I had missed one out, but yeah. Fine. Anything else? Okay. So we're just going to go through some cases to see if you would be able to come down, uh, you know, with a history and an examination, narrow down the diagnosis. So we'll pick on someone who hasn't been asked so far. Okay, Charlotte, I know I've asked you already, but okay. So you've got a 35 year old lady who presents with back pain and right leg pain, which has been going on for three months. What sort of questions do you want to ask her? Um, if she's noticed any, um, if so, if the onset was due to trauma or something. So okay, no trauma. Um, if she's had any recent infections no um has she got any associated symptoms with it so any numbness or pins and needles okay anything like that so she's got so if the so first thing first she's 35 years old mm -hmm. so and she's presenting with back pain so do you think it is going to be uh, what is going to be the most likely cause um It could it it could be degenerative, but I yeah. think you want to rule out infection. Absolutely. Tumor. So first, you want to go through the history about what they've presented itself. Okay, so you would just go through your Socrates going through the back pain. Okay, so mm -hmm. she's got back pain and it is in her lower back. Okay, and she says the pain goes down her right leg. Mm -hmm. You want to ask anything more about where the pain is in her leg? Um whereabouts and where okay. so whereabouts the, pain goes all the, way down, the pain goes up to the ankle okay um is the pain brought on by something or relieved by anything uh, it's brought on by walking or standing for any length of time okay uh um i had something i forgot what it was <laughs> um uh, has she noticed anything relieves the pain at all uh, painkillers help her. She takes gabapentin for pain. Um, has she noticed anything in her left leg? Has that felt different? No, no pain in the left leg, only right leg pain. Okay. Um, what, how, would, how would you describe the pain? It's a constant pain. It's usually three to four out of ten, but as soon as she walks or anything, it gets up to eight or nine. Okay. On a scale of one to ten, where would you put the pain? <laughs> Sorry? On a scale of one to ten, with ten being the worst pain imaginable. Yeah, so when it gets pain? worse, it can become up to eight to nine, but most of the time it's around three to four. Okay. Um, so from the history that she's given, yeah. she doesn't have any bowel bladder problems and no other systemic symptoms, what you were trying to ask before. Mm -hmm. From this history, what do you think the likely cause is? Um, a degenerative problem. Yeah. Okay. So, which is pretty much, she's 35. It's a sort of a, you know, gradual onset pain. It's been going on for some time and there are no other red flags. Mm -hmm. So it is likely that this is going to be a degenerative problem. Okay. So you examine this lady. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you've made her walk. She's got a normal gait. All right. You've examined her lower limbs. What do you expect to find when you do a straight leg raise? Uh, pain. Yeah. Up her right, her right leg. Yeah. Um, when you dorsiflex her foot. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So 
I'll just show her a scan, then you can, I might ask you further questions. So this is our MRI scan. So what you see on the left is a sagittal section. On the right is an axial section. You can see that line that is cutting through the spine that is at the L5S1 level. And on the right side, what you see, I can point to, I don't know if you could see this white area, that's the spinal canal. Yeah. Now, comparing the previous slide to this, can you see there is a disc prolapse here? Look on the left side, you can see there is something black sticking out here. It's a shame I really thought this pointer would work. Anyone very tech techie can tell me how to show these things to you guys. Can you see me drawing that line there? Yeah. Yeah, so that is the disc prolapse there. Okay, and you can see that disc prolapse here. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Compare that to the previous section. So this is the spinal canal. Yeah nice and round and that is where the nerves are and see that in the next picture where you can see the disc that has come out which is pressing on the nerve which is causing your white leg symptoms okay so how do you want to treat this patient do you know what's the natural cause for disc prolapse no. do all <laughs> patients with a disc prolapse need an operation yes uh, not necessarily. <laughs> unless, otherwise, unless otherwise they have a bowel bladder problems or any significant neurology, they don't need. Majority of the disc prolapses will get better on their own. Okay. Okay. Six to eight weeks, usually they will get better. If not, then you, you can consider further intervention. So in reality, so this was a first scan and this was a scan in four months time when you can see actually the disc prolapse is completely resolved. Mm -hmm. You can see, you can't see any evidence of that disc being out at all. Okay. So case two, uh, Alex, 65 year old man presenting with back pain. What do you want to know? You're on mute. Where in, whereabouts in his back is the pain? Okay. The pain is in his lower back. Uh, how long has it been there for? Uh, it's been there for nearly a year. It's been okay. gradually coming on. Yeah. Okay. What kind of pain is it? It's like a dull throbbing pain. Yeah. Most Does it go anywhere? Like a, sorry? Does it go anywhere? It goes down both his legs, all the way down to his uh, calf. Okay. Um, anything make it better or worse? Uh, as soon as he starts walking, if he walks for like 10 minutes to go around to the shop, the pain gets worse. He has to stop and he has to either lean on to something or he has to sit down. If he can't find a seat, it gets quite painful. Okay. Um, has he got any associated symptoms with it? Bowel bladder, bladder disturbances, weakness? No, he does not have any bowel bladder problems. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, any night pain? No. No, sweating? No. No, okay. Um, any history of cancer? No. No. Uh, so from that, it sounds, it's kind of no real red flags. Okay. Um, but it's going down both legs. Has there been any sensation change down the legs? So let's, uh, he, he says he does get some numbness when he gets that pain really bad. When he's walking for 10 minutes, he gets okay. the numbness in both his calves and he feels as if the calves are tight. Okay. Okay. So what so, does this history suggest to you? Um, some degenerative changes in. Okay. For the symptoms that I've described, do you know of any terminology? Uh, like a sciatica type thing. It starts with a C. Claudication. Have you heard of claudication? Symptoms? Yeah, claudication. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So how would you differentiate this claudication? So this is, what are the two types of claudication that you know of? Um, 
so there's there's like acute claudication and then where okay so we're talking about the spine term so this has got to be one neurogenic claudication and the other one is vascular claudication yeah okay, okay. Yeah, so yeah. the neurogenic claudication patients usually say they walk they get the yeah. pain but then they have to sit down or they have to lean forwards for the pain to ease that is because the space it's because of spinal stenosis it's already tight when they are actually walking you're more erect, when you're more erect, it becomes more tighter and it causes the problem so yeah. they don't want to they want to sit down or they want to lean forwards for the symptoms to ease but if it's a vascular claudication, which is because of peripheral artery disease, they will yeah. walk, they will get the pain, but even if they stop and stand, the pain will get better because the muscles are not working. The blood flow that's coming is more than adequate. The pain gets better. This is the textbook description. Quite a few patients do fit in it, but it's just something to guide you to, you know, see yeah. whether the symptoms are because of spine or because of vascular. Okay. So from the history that you've taken so far, you can say that there's no red flags, okay? Yeah. And you're suspecting a degenerative problem. Any specific conditions that you can think of uh, that I've said is age 65? Um, like spondylosis? Yeah, spondylosis is general degenerative change. Yeah. A spondylolisthesis or yeah. spinal stenosis. Yeah, spinal stenosis. So he's had an MRI scan. Can you see where the arrow is? You can see how there is a hourglass constriction. You can see it's quite nice and wide up here. And at L45 level, there's a hourglass constriction. And on the axial section, if you see, you know, like in the previous scan, you saw there was a nice white round canal, but here you can't see any canal at all. It is yeah. all black here. So that's because of the spinal stenosis. The disc degeneration, the facet degeneration, everything is narrowing the space in the spinal canal so which means all the nerves are getting compressed and that is the reason why he's getting the symptoms so this is spinal stenosis okay yeah so what do you want to do for this patient then um so i think because of these kind of symptoms and that it's yeah. getting progressively worse um it doesn't tend to get better by itself yeah um so if he can't like uh, painkillers could be one option um yeah. and then some kind of surgical management decompression yeah good is, so that's always a good way to start okay you yeah. don't want to jump for surgery you want to try non-operative care so painkillers physio physio yeah. mainly cardiac you know cardio exercises you know muscle strengthening exercises this is not going to dramatically get worse it's not going to be like a curve going down like that. They're usually in a plateau phase. They'll have a bit of a drop and then they'll continue like that and then they'll have a bit of a drop. So yeah, that's the way to do it. So, and then you would consider a decompression in him. There is, there is compression, you want to take it off. So it's a decompression operation, okay? Yeah. So next case. Uh, Gamisha. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So, a 30-year-old man presenting with sudden onset pain in his back, which is between the shoulder blades, and he feels as if the pain is shooting from his shoulder blade area down to both his legs. The pain's just come on only in the last two to three days. He's in excruciating pain. Okay. What do you want to do? Or what, do you, what else do you want to know? Um, so when does the pain come on? When? When does the pain come on? Uh, uh, it's just been constantly for the last 24 hours now. It's is a there severe, any, severe pain. Is there anything that makes it better or worse? Uh, there is nothing that is making it better. But as soon as he bends forward or does any movement, the pain is really bad. Okay. He feels like as if it's an electric shock coming down both his legs. Okay. Um, any associated bowel or bladder symptoms? Uh, no, he hasn't noticed any bowel bladder problems. Or any loss of sensation? Or... He feels as if these electric shocks go down both his legs. He feels as if his legs are also a bit weak 
and he's been struggling to walk since yesterday. Okay. Um, any systemic symptoms? He's been a bit uh, not very well since yesterday. He's been having cold sweats. Okay. Any recent infections? Uh, no. Do you have cancer? No. Okay. And not immunocompromised in any other way? Uh, no. So how, what are you going to ask him to know whether he's immunocompromised or not? If he's on any specific medications? Or no, he's not? not on any medications. Or significant uh, medical history? In no medical history. Um, okay. Uh, it sounds like something sinister. Anything, anything further you want to go into his history? Just going through, you know, we've mainly talked about the past medical, you know, we, we haven't gone in detail about the past medical history and everything because that's generic for all systems anyway. Yeah. Anything else you want to ask? Social history, past medical history, anything else you think might be relevant? Family history? There's nothing significant in his family history. Um, Social history? Um, how has he been able to walk and dress himself, do his normal activities of daily living? So this is all a very short history and he's really struggling in the last 24 to 48 hours. Okay, I'll just help you out. He's a, he says that he smokes and he also injects occasionally. Okay, what does he inject? I don't know, some, some sort of drugs. Okay. Is that worrying? Does that put him at risk for anything? Um, I was thinking quarter coiner. Mm, more than that. So where did I say the pain is? It's between the shoulder blades. Is that a worrying sign? Yes. So that's thoracic pain, a yeah. very short history, severe pain with shooting electric sort of thing down the legs. He's got some systemic symptoms. He's a known IVDU. So yeah. That is a risk for patients to develop infection. Yeah. Okay. So those things should prompt you. And he's had a scan. So on examination. He's in so much pain that he doesn't even let you examine. Okay. But you can just see that uh, gross examination that he can't move his legs very well. And the a &E doctor tells you from the time he's coming to a &E to now itself, his weakness has progressed. He's not moving his legs more. These are all real life cases. Can you see anything abnormal on that scan? Anybody, anybody? Anything catches you out? You see this? That's pus. That's an epidural abscess. You see that? So this is the spinal cord going there, but you can see that's the pus that is collected behind the spinal cord. And that's just causing spinal cord compression, which is the reason why he's acutely deteriorating. And the symptoms that he was describing with the shooting pain, like electric shocks, that is because of spinal cord compression called as a limit sign. So when he's trying to flex forward or anything, there is increased compression on the spinal cord causing the symptoms. Okay. So what do you want to do about this? Spinal decompression. Yeah. Very good. Very good. So it's important to just uh, be uh, vigilant about the symptoms, you know, also making sure that you may ask about the red flags. Okay. So case four, uh, way, way. Um, yes. um, so, yeah, sorry, sorry we, go on. Yeah, well, we've got another lecture starting in about 20 minutes. So okay, I'll just wind up with the last two cases. Is, is that all right? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, 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 sorry. Okay, uh, wait, I've got a 40 year old lady who uh, presents with neck pain 
and pain going down her shoulders and down into her arms. Is there anything specific you want to know? Um, when did the pain start? Uh, it's been going on for five to six months. Okay. Um, what type of pain is it? Um, it's a sharp pain. It goes down all the way into her fingers. Okay. Um, are there any, um, any other symptoms associated with She's pain? got uh, pins and needles in her hands. She's noticed that her handwriting has changed. Her hands are a bit clumsy as well with her right hand. She works in a bank and she's noticed that she's finding it difficult to use the keyboard. Okay. Um, is there, has it gotten worse since it started five to six months ago? It is gradually getting worse. Okay. And is, does anything make it better or worse? Um, rest makes it better, but any physical activity like driving makes it worse. Okay. Um, any... Um, oh, let's see. Any, any other red flags? Your, yeah, any... Um, is there pain at night? No pain at night. Any fever, loss of weights or... No. Okay. Um, any history of cancer no. or infection? Okay. Any bladder or bowel changes? No. And, okay. Mm. Okay. So you're examining her and uh, she has sensory deficit in the C6 dermatome. Where is C6 dermatome? Where would you examine that, for C6? Is that the... Uh, is that a web for? Sorry. Um, um, is that the the so the first web space? Yeah, the first web space. Okay, C six. So where do you test for C six motor power? Is that like the supinator? So you test for wrist extension. Okay. Okay. All right. So she's had an MRI scan, and you can see that she's got a disc prolapse at C five six. Can you see that? And that is causing spinal cord compression here as well. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to quickly show you one or two more cases and then we'll be here. So, and she's had an anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. So I'm just going to run through this case. So this is a 55 year old lady who's known to have back pain. She's complaining of pain in the prolumbar junction. She's been there for three months and she's been gradually getting worse. Uh, she's been back and forth to physios, but because it was in the thoracolumbar area, they didn't really pay much attention. They said, oh, it's low back pain. It'll go away. But uh, no one really paid attention to the fact that she was in a case of breast cancer treated four or five years ago. So they just treated her for a low back pain until then one of the GPs who had changed jobs or something had come in and picked up the history and just can't find that metastasis here. And you can see it's causing spinal cord compression. So T12 spinal cord compression. So it's very important to pay attention to the history, you know. So if you have a compression in civilization, spinal cord compression. So the last case, uh, it's a 35 year old man presently with uh, back pain. The pain is mainly in his lower back. It doesn't go down his legs or anything. No systemic symptoms, no bowel bladder problems, uh, no other red flag symptoms. He's a manual laborer presenting with his pain. Uh, Priscilla? Yes. So from the history that I've said, is there anything concerning you? So back pain, no bladder problems, yeah. no systemic no. Uh, issues. Did you say no? And he's a 32 year old man. 32? Yeah. Okay. Uh, his occupation? He's a laborer. When the back did you say it was again? Sorry, it's there when? all the time, it gets worse with his job. All right, but is it like 
overall the back or somewhere just before? lower back lower back lower back okay mm. there was nothing so, that's from what you said but um okay. does he let's see there's no other uh, no other past medical history he's a non-smoker no drugs or anything mm -hmm. and clinical examination is unremarkable other than just you know, that he's in back pain and his spinal movements are a bit restricted. And these are the kind of patients you're going to see most of the time. He's essentially got non-specific back pain, what we call as a mechanical back pain. If you look at his scan, he's got two degenerate discs, but there is no evidence of any nerve compression. Okay. But to make sure that he hasn't got any other sinister pathology before you say, this is just mechanical back pain. This has just got to be treated with physio and painkillers. You need to be absolutely sure that, you know, you've gone through a detailed history Mm -hmm. examination and also getting the investigations to rule that out and you know reassure them mm -hmm. okay okay fine anyway we'll end that there so if you guys got any questions even if you're not able to ask now i'm sure you can pass it on to julie and she'll be able to get in touch could you uh, repeat we'll say that word again the the effusion from the case of the cervical spine you said like this chi something if you Effusion. The cervical spine case. Yeah. The operation. Mm -hmm. Anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. So we've removed the disc and fused that part of the spine. There. So there is a cage instead of where the disc was, and it's got some artificial bone mm -hmm. to stop movement at that level. Right. So the problem happened because of degenerative problems because of the wear and tear. So you're stopping the movement. So you're not going to get any further problems at that level. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I've uh, run a bit longer than. Uh, That's all right. That's fine. Um, the, I've recorded the lecture, so it'll be in the cloud. So I'll have a look at how to share that um, okay. or how people can access it. Um, and um, yeah, if you've got any questions or anything you think of after the lecture, just drop me an email and I'll forward them on. Yeah, um, it's but quite yeah, difficult thanks. to do the clinical examination as such. Hopefully once this uh, situation is over, you guys are more than welcome to come to our clinics, which will be a bit more easier to you know, show and do things. Yeah. It's a little bit difficult in the virtual world, which I guess we yeah. may have used to. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Thanks very much. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, please be, uh, um, uh, you'll get a feedback form.